and welcome to Advanced Patterns for API Management in large-scale React applications. My name is Thomas Finley, and I'm a full-stack web and mobile developer with nine years of programming experience. I'm a co-owner of Finley WebTech and a mentor and consultant at CodeMentor.io. I'm also the author of Vue and React The Road to Enterprise books, as well as a technical writer for Telerik and The Road to Enterprise blogs. Now, let's have a look at what we are going to cover today. So first of all, we will start with how to manage API requests in React in a scalable and flexible manner with an API layer. Then, we will see how to handle different API states while performing API requests. We'll also create custom hooks to manage API requests and states, as well as how to cancel requests with Axios and an API layer. Finally, we'll have a look at how to use React Query and API layer and how to cancel requests with them. Okay, so how can we perform API requests in React? Actually, it's quite simple, right? We can, for instance, use Axios for that. We can just import it and use it in our components. And well, it can work fine for, let's say, small applications. But there are some issues as the project grows, especially large ones, really. So what are the main problems with this approach? First of all, code duplication and lack of reusability. Because imagine that we need to, uh, for instance, fetch information about a user, let's say on the login page, register page, and the user profile page. So all of these would have, well, the same code snippet, something like access, get, a, a URL endpoint, and so on and so on, right? So that's not very really reusable. And also, well, it's hard to maintain because if we had to make any changes to this code, like let's say, for instance, the URL endpoint change, or we had to change the payload format, or let's say we had to migrate from using Axios to something like Firebase, right? We would need to visit every single component that uses Axios and change them. Well, that's not really great, to be honest. So let's have a look at how we can fix these issues by implementing an API layer. So first, we would start with a base API file, where we would import Axios and create a new instance with some default configuration, like for instance, a base URL. Then we'd have an API uh, function that basically returns a API wrapper methods around our HTTP client, in this case, Axios. And finally, we export it. Next, what we can do is we can use this base API file and import it in another API file. So for example, in this case, we'd have users API file because we want to do some things with users like fetch information about users, add a new user, and so on. In this example, we have three methods, list users, get user, and add user. And as you can see, they all use the API methods from the base API file. And how would we use this in a component now? So basically what we would do so we would import an API method from the API directory and then just use it in a component. So as you can see, the component doesn't have to think about what kind of API endpoint has to be hit, right? The API method takes care of that. So what about if we wanted to use a different HTTP client, like let's say for instance, Firebase instead of Axios. So our base API file would look a bit different so here we would just import some necessary Firebase methods, would initialize the Firebase app, and then we would export uh, what we need. So for instance, Firebase, Firestore, which gives us methods to uh, basically, well, connecting with the database uh, and so on, and other things like off storage functions, etc. Now, in the users API file, we would again have the same methods like list users, get user, and add user. Uh, however, in this case, we're using Firebase, of course, right? Under the hood. But let's have a look at how it would look like from the component's perspective now. Well, actually, for the component, nothing would change because it still would import the API method from the user's API file and it would just execute it, right? So that's a really great thing about the API layer because it's like a black box to your components, right? Uh, because your components don't need to yeah, don't really have to care about what you use uh, to perform requests. What it really, uh, what, uh, you know, it only is concerned with what methods it should call, what kind of input it should provide, and what kind of output it can expect. As long as you can preserve this input and output contract, you don't need to make any changes to your components. Only You only need to make changes to the API layer, really. 
Now, let's have a look at the benefits of the API layer. First of all, maintainability, as all the API related code is in one place. Scalability, as you can easily add new API methods and files. And we also have flexibility, but it's much easier to replace the HTTP client and also enhance the API layer with custom logic. So as you just seen, we replaced the access with Firebase and we didn't need to make any changes to the component. And also code reusability, because API methods can be just imported and used anywhere in the application. And well, API layer pattern is also framework agnostic. Okay, so next let's have a look at how we can handle API states. So what I've seen in a, in a lot of applications is basically using Boolean flags, right? For instance, if you want to show a spinner, you would have is loading state. If you want to show an error, if for instance, if for instance request failed, you would have an is error flag. And let's say if we want to lazily initialize a request, for instance, if a user clicks a button or if a user scrolls to a certain element, then we can also have is initialized flag, right? So as you can see here, we have three different states and then all of them are updated, updated accordingly. The problem, how, oh yeah, and here as you can see, um, if the, it wasn't initialized, initialized, we display a button. If it's loading, we display uh, loading data message, we can display a spinner. If, it, you know, if there was an error, then there was a problem. And finally, if everything went all right, we are displaying the data. Uh, but yeah, the problem, however, is that for each uh, API state, we need, well, a new use state hook, right? So we have initialized, is loading, is error. So that's already three states. And that's only for one API request. If we need to make two requests, we might need to have six states. If we need to make three requests, we might need nine and so on and so on. But that's not very great. So let's have a look at how we can improve it by well, using API states instead. And we will also implement a use API status hook to help us with that. So first of all, we have four different API states. Idle, which means that basically the request didn't start yet. Then we have pending, which means that the request is being performed. And then we also have success and error. So obviously success is for when request uh, completed successfully and error if there was a problem. We also have an array here, which basically just exports the constants uh, as we'll need it in a moment. So uh, let's go now to use API status hook. So first of all, uh, we have, we need to import use state and use memo. And we also get uh, the idle constant as that's our initial state for the hook. And we also get default statuses. And the reason why we need them is because we want to basically take all our statuses and then base, and then basically return an object with, uh, basically the statuses like, you know, is idle, is pending, is success, is error, as you can see on the right side on the slide. And only one of them will be active at the time. So for instance, at the start, only idle, is idle will be set to true. And now here's our use API status hook. So we have our state for it. So yeah, in comparison to Boolean flags, we have only one state that holds all the API statuses. And only one of them can be active at the same time. Then uh, we have the result of prepper prepare statuses. As I mentioned, mentioned uh, basically it's an object that has that has is idle, is pending, and so on. And we use use memo here so that it only reevaluates if the API status changes. And then finally, we return an object with API status, set API statuses uh, method, and all the normalized statuses. Now let's have a look at how we can use it. So as you can see here, we basically uh, initialize the use API status hook and we can pass the idle there, though it's the default state anyway. If you wanted to start with pending immediately, you can do that. And then we destructure all the statuses as well as the set API status method, which then is used to basically update this API status accordingly. Before the request is started, we set it to pending. If it's completed successfully, we set it to success. If there was a problem, we set it to an error. And as you can see in the markup, uh, we can basically just add ternaries, right? If it's idle, then we do something. If it's pending, then we show the spinner or loading message. If it's error, then an error and so on and so on. So it's much cleaner this way. We don't need to have as many Boolean flags and the code is yeah much cleaner and more concise. <clears throat> 
page. So now let's have a look at how we can improve it even further by implementing a custom use API hook. So <clears throat> first of all, we import use state again, as well as the use API status hook that we've just covered, and three API statuses, pending, success, and error. Then use API accepts two parameters. The first one is the method that will execute an API request. And the second one is a config object. So for instance, in this example, we can pass uh, initial data inside of the config object and set it on the state for the data. Besides the data state, we also have a state for the error. And of course, we initialize the use API status hook. Now, next, inside of use API hook, we have the exec function. So as you can see, what it does, it takes care of uh, basically setting uh, API statuses and updating them accordingly, depending on the status of the request. It also takes care of setting the data after the request uh, finished successfully. And it will also handle setting the error if there was a problem. And it will clear it out if a request is supposed to be started again. And finally, uh, the exec uh, method returns an object with data and error if we needed to handle them. Okay, and yeah, last but not least, just return everything from uh, the use API hook data, API status error, exec, and so on. And now, how can we use this hook? So, obviously, we'll need to import it and then just pass the method that is supposed to uh, execute uh, the API request. So, in this case, we're passing a method that will just return the, re the result of get user, which obviously comes from the um, API layer. And from the use API, we receive an object from which we destructure this, the normalized statuses, the data, and the exec method. And as you can see in the JSX, again, depending on the status, we just return appropriate markup. So, you know, for is idle, the button to initialize fetching, for spending the spinner, and so on and so on. Okay, now, so how can we cancel requests when using Axios with the API layer? So actually, uh, we can enhance the API layer with abort logic. So in the base API file, we would add the with abort method that would first accept a function. So this function would be one of Axios methods like Axios get, Axios uh, put, post, path, and so on, right? Then with abort returns a function, which, well, basically these arguments uh, should be the ones that are passed to access methods. So for instance, URL, body, and config, right? Then what we're doing there is we need to get access to the original config. And the reason for it is because as part of this config, we want to pass an abort property, which should have a function as a value. And what we are doing here, if abort is a function indeed, then we create a new cancel method and a cancel token using uh, access source method. And on the config object, we assign this cancel token. And finally, we execute the abort method and pass the canceller there. And you will see why we did that in a moment. And finally, uh, after enhancing the config object, we just execute the request. So we forward uh, all the parameters besides the last one. And the reason for it is because we don't want to pass the original config with the abort property, but rather we want to pass our own enhanced config object that doesn't have the abort property, but might have a cancel token. And note that uh, it's important that we use await here because if there was an error, uh, basically without await, this error wouldn't be caught in the context of with abort. Uh, so that's why we need await here. And then finally, if there's an error, we use access's is cancel method to check if uh, the request was canceled. And if it was, we basically set an aborted property on the error object and we just throw the error feather so it can hand be handled outside. So let's, okay, one more thing. We also need to wrap, uh, of course, our API wrapper methods with, with abort. So like I mentioned before, we first pass access methods and then we initialize it again and forward all the parameters. Okay, so here's how we can use it. Now, so imagine uh, basically a feature like, uh, you know, a search box, for instance, user can enter some query and there will be an API request made to fetch some information, for instance, for autocomplete. 
So we have two states, one for the data that will be uh, fetched from the API and one for the query that the user enters. And we also have the search about ref. So that's an important part here. Because the thing is that we need to be able to store the canceller method uh, in between re renders, right? So that's why we will put it on a ref. But first, let's just have a look at the onQuery change uh, function. So what's happening here? Well, obviously we are setting uh, the input value on the query, but that's not the important part here really. But here, before the request is initialized, we are trying to cancel the previous one. However, there might be no canceller method when the onQuery change is initialized for the first time. So that's why we use optional chaining operator. So basically, if there's a canceller method, execute it. But if it's not, then that's fine. We don't care, but we don't want uh, the JavaScript engine to throw an error here, right? So that's why we use the optional chain operator. And then next, as the part here, the abort property. So basically, as part of the config object, we pass this abort property that receives a function, and the canceller method is passed as the first argument. And then we can basically uh, assign this canceller on a ref so that when this onQuery change is initialized again, we will have access to this canceller. And finally, in the catch statement, we basically check if the error was aborted, right? And yeah, it was. And what's really great about the way it is implemented is that basically the uh, implementation details of the HTTP client, which is access in this case, didn't leak into our component at all. We didn't have to import it anywhere. Rather, we only have to provide the abort property uh, in, and that's where we get the canceller method, set it on a ref and voila, it's available for us. And we can just call it. Okay, so now let's have a look at how we can use uh, the API layer with React Query. Well, actually, it's quite simple because <laughs> really what we only need to do is import the API method from the API layer. Uh, also import uh, whichever hook we need from React Query, like for instance, use query in this case. And then we just use it, right? We pass the key for the query. Then we pass our list, well, in this case, list users, so the API method. And we just destructure what we need. So for instance, in this case, we get data, we get the refetch method, which can be used to initialize the request. And we also get our normalized statuses. Again, and this part is basically the same as uh, it was with, let's say, with our own use API hook, right? And depending on the status, we render appropriate content. And how can we cancel request when using API layer with React Query? Well, again, right? Uh, we can basically pass uh, an abort property. However, this time, what we are doing is we're not using a ref, but rather, but rather we have a cancel variable and we assign this uh, canceler method that was passed through the, uh, the abort property to this cancel variable. Because the thing is that the way React Query works is that it expects a cancel property to be available on the promise that is returned. So that's why we need to do it this way. I think it also is very concise and clean. And here, finally, if you want to cancel the request, we just need to call cancel queries. That's it for today. Here are the links to the GitHub repo with full code examples, slides for this talk, and websites where you can find me. What's more, I have a special gift for all the conference attendees. React the Road to Enterprise is coming this December. It's an advanced book with best practices, patterns, and techniques that covers many various uh, concepts such as uh, scalable project architecture, local and global state management, testing, API handling, performance optimization, SSG and SSR with Next.js, and more. You can get 35% off with the code REACT ADVANCED. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, talk and happy coding.